State University and director of the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation Systems on behalf of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. And got his education, a bachelor's, PhD at the University of Minnesota, master's at Iowa State University, and did a postdoctoral at University of Minnesota. And the resume is long, Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Uh, he was a professor at Cornell University for 16 years, at which time I had the good fortune of working with him on two of our favorite fish, brook trout and lake trout. And Chuck's going to talk to us today about one of his long-term research interests, which is uh, lake trout management and ecology. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so this, uh, I, my instructions were uh, consider lake trout, consider the concept of ecological resilience. And so this is basically just uh, some musing, some opinion on my part about lake trout and the concept of resilience. Now, I should have probably looked at this before. So, yep, that works. Okay. So, uh, Brian already has done uh, just an eloquent job of talking about resilience. Uh, when I think about it, it's sort of in this notion of the capacity of an ecosystem, not a species, but an ecosystem, to respond to perturbation, uh, being able to resist damage and recover quickly to that disturbance. Or, in other words, persistence of systems and their ability to absorb change and disturbance and still maintain the same relationships between populations and state variables. Uh, really, the concept of ecological resilience, I think, is, has always been centered really on a system focus. Uh, and then as that matured, it began to be applied to social systems. And in reality, I'm applying this at a species level somewhat down. So it's could be inappropriate, but what the heck, thought I'd give it a try. Uh, so we're just, we're going to look at it mainly at a species level, but I'm going to comment just briefly on uh, lake trout ecosystems and then one slide on uh, management, the political social aspect. So are they resilient at a species level, at a system level, or in their management? Uh, let's see, let's go back. So my approach here is to take a look at the species level now at what I consider non-independent life history characteristics. So these are, are characteristics that, you know, one is clearly related to another. They don't stand independently. And then to ask the question, you know, does that characteristic provide some capability to withstand or uh, provide some uh, capability for adaptation? So the first one I looked at, or I thought about with lake trout was, I would claim that lake trout are diet diverse. They, they eat a lot of different things. Uh, well known as adults to be top predators of small fishes, to be isobores. Uh, but in the Adirondacks and in many lakes in Ontario, the province, uh, they're actually uh, dominant planktivores. Uh, up in uh, Great Bear Lake, one of the lakes that I've worked on, uh, there's one form up there that they're not obligate insectivores, but they predominantly feed on insects in shallow waters. Uh, now the Pissivari also involves cannibalism, probably most of you know that, but I thought I'd better throw that in just for good measure. Somewhat unknown, they can be at time, right times of the year obviously, big egg predators. Uh, and then, in terms of an illustration of resilience, when we do get invasive species like ground gobies, I mean, they just gobbled them up in the Great Lakes. And uh, last, a uh, very interesting lane, one of the uh, deep water forms of lake trout in Lake Superior, the Sisquat or the Fats, Every diet study, now these things are supposedly only living at 100 meters or deeper. All the diet studies show cisquets eat songbirds and they eat mammals. So, uh, interestingly, maybe they're not always deep water. Uh, here's a fish I caught personally out of Great Bear Lake up in the uh, Dees Arm, which is up in the northwest 
corner of Great Bear Lake. It probably doesn't look like any lake trout that you have in the Adirondacks, but this one we call the butterfly. And these things uh, spawn ahead of what we call giants up there. We were catching giants for our study, but this guy was in a, and amongst the, the, uh, the giants. So we, I was hungry and we wanted shore lunch, so we killed this beautiful fish and put him on a fire. Now when we cleaned him, this is what this guy had in its stomach. Uh, now this black blob, if you kind of look here, I think I can make a point, that's a tail. Down here is an eye. Uh, that's a uh, that's a bowl. Okay, so this butterfly was up feeding on the surface, and uh, it was also feeding on uh, giant lake trout eggs. Uh, the eggs aren't giant, but the giants were spawning these eggs, and then at the same time feeding on gastropods or snails. So here's a lake trout that was feeding from top to bottom. So diet diverse, uh, you could contrast then that diet diversity with something that's, say, less uh, resilient, and I'm going to claim this as a less resilient example. It's the inability to switch to different food sources when something collapses. The recent example that I thought about was Chinook salmon in the Great Lakes, and particularly in Lake Huron, where Elwise was a dominant food item for the Chinooks. Uh, literally, the alewives collapsed. Virtual absence now of salmon, even with stocking, and uh, long-term naturalized population, particularly in the province of Ontario. So here's a picture of alewife abundance in Lake Huron that collapsed in 2004, and uh, catch then collapsing in 2005, and the anglers having the joy of catching Chinooks that look like this, uh, not particularly in good condition. So lake trout are also interesting in that they have many age classes. Uh, they have very complex age structure. And we've been working through populations in Lake Superior as well as further uh, lakes and further north. Uh, here's an example of a humper, which is another ecomorphal type we caught off of Isle Royal, you know, large island national park in Lake Superior. This one was aged at uh, 46 years. And you can see it's not a very particularly large fish, but it's uh, characteristic of a lot of the lake trout that we see. But you get some really old fish. Now, first maturity with lake trout occurs, uh, we often think age seven. I know Lake Erie, age five, but Lake Erie's a hot place for lake trout. Anyway, very southern edge of the range. The more, much more common maturity schedules for lake trout is uh, more like nine, even in Lake Superior. And as you go north, you see 15 and 20 even. But uh, you can easily have a large number of reproductive age classes in lake trout populations. So this is age like nine to 40. You could have uh, 30 or more spawning age classes. Now, thing is, is that requires then a low total annual mortality rate. That's the Achilles heel of lake trout, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, but certainly, in terms of resiliency, it would seem to me, at least, that uh, you'd have no problem. If you've got 30 spawning age classes out there, you're not going to have any problem suffering the failure of a couple uh, bad recruitments for a year or two. In fact, maybe you'd have to have 10 years in a row to actually have a serious problem where recovery would be seriously hampered. And you could contrast that to something like a pink salmon, okay? Pink salmon have a rigid two-year life cycle. Uh, that's it. That's what they do in the Pacific Ocean. Great Lakes is where they're non-native. It's a little different, but Pacific Ocean, that's the way it works. Uh, there's one. Uh, spawning age class any particular year you have odd and even year runs that actually operate somewhat like separate populations but if you had two years of reproductive failure at least in that stream then the, theoretically anyway the population or the, that species could actually go away now uh, pink salmon compensates their resiliency strategy is all based on weak spawning site fidelity such that uh, 
they don't come back to their streams that well, not like, say, Chinook salmon do. Uh, wide range of habitats. Now, lake trout are stereotyped. Well, their name is even lake, isn't it? Yeah. So they're stereotyped as a lake dweller. But uh, in reality, they use lakes and rivers uh, for spawning. And this is historically true in the Great Lakes. Uh, this is a paper by Ken Loftus in 1958 in Transactions, documenting river spawning populations in Lake Superior. A lot of our thoughts about lake trout, I think, are based really on, on a, a lot of work that's been done in the southern edge of the range, and I think that somewhat biases in our, our viewpoint of what lake trout can do, uh, because there's a whole lot of lakes further north than the Great Lakes and Adirondacks and places like that. They are actually frequent occupants of rivers, and this they do uh, for spawning, but also for feeding. They will follow in, say, Corygonus ardenite populations that come into the rivers, say, at Great Slave Lake, uh, that'd be the, uh, the Cisco populations. They come into the rivers there, and the lake trout follow them in and voraciously feed. And uh, they also show anatomy. And here's a paper by Heidi Swanson in 2010 documenting the anatomy of lake trout populations in the Arctic. Now you can contrast that to something like uh, desert pupfish by def definition, very restricted habitats for cave fish. So wrapped into all of this, uh, this diet diversity and habitats and stuff, is that lake trout show a strong sort of phenotypic diversification, which reflects some levels of adaptation to their habitats. And, and to the distribution of food resources in these uh, in these lakes, we, some people call these things uh, ecomorphal types. So this is ecological diversification that reflects adaptation through their morphology. So they can be changes that occur. You saw some earlier with the butterfly lake trout from Great Bear Lake, but fins and body shape and the mouth size and the shape of the mouth all uh, have some of that. Uh, adaptation going on. Uh, oftentimes, these ecomorphal types are also associated with genetic differentiation. Chars are interesting. They're not, they don't always do that. They show a range from uh, no evidence of genetic differentiation among morphal types to almost like complete separation. And that's true for lake trout and Arctic char. Uh, there are some hardwired some genetic physiological differences that have been well documented uh, that it affects in their habitat <coughs> use. And this would be like fat accumulation. So Rick Getz's papers in the last five years particularly have shown that. And Eason um, and Tate, 1974, with gas bladder retention. All these things relate then to the buoyancy compensation. If you're a scuba diver, you've got a BC on, you've got to fill it up with air, you've got to do something to make yourself go up and down the water column. Lake trout got this figured out. So uh, these adaptations then allow a three-dimensional use of the different trophic or energetic resources in the lake. So they can be pisivores or bathivores, and they can show diel vertical migrations of lakes. And that helps them to be diet diverse and use those energy resources. They also uh, allows them then to separate in space, and we most often think about this in terms of depth, shallow and deep, and uh, allows them then to use a wide range of habitats. Uh, in species poor environments where lake trout typically live, these recently glaciated oligotrophic lakes, uh, essentially these ecomorphic types become the equivalent of different species. So here's a cartoon sort of thing, uh, sort of trying to illustrate some of this. We got a shallow water lake trout and a deep water lake trout. And uh, there's a selection gradient here where it gets dark as you go down. Uh, you get less variable temperatures. Um, as you go down in depth, you get higher hydrostatic pressures. And you have, you have different prey available. You have Sculpins typically, and sometimes different species of sculpins in shallow and deep waters. You have vertically, diel vertically migrating mycids, 
uh, and different invertebrates between <coughs> shallow and deep waters. And you can have pelagic prey for lake trout, like the cisco or non-native smell. Uh, in our Laurentian Great Lakes, as well as the Canadian Great Lakes, uh, there are deep water ciscos that uh, also show this diurnal vertical migration, presumably following the mice for food. And so our shallow water lake trout can pretty much stay in the shallow water feeding on those pelagic prey or sculpins or the invertebrates. And the deep water lake trout, because they have these buoyancy compensating mechanisms, that show diurnal vertical migration too, feeding both on mices and deep water ciscos. And a lot of this has been talked about. Uh, one example paper is Tom Braddock's paper in 2006, and Henderson and Anderson in 2002 talked about buoyancy compensation. Here's just a pictogram, I guess, of, uh, of the different forms of lake trout that I've had the great pleasure to work with uh, in North America. Uh, if you started up at the uh, far left corner, uh, that's Great Bear Lake. Uh, there's probably, I would estimate, maybe six to eight different forms that are easily recognizable. It's tough to get the samples, but four uh, described, I think you can pick out the giant uh, and then the butterfly at the end. Uh, up in Great Slave Lake, up in this uh, right hand corner. Uh, we were able to uh, find uh, deep water equimorphal types that are essentially identical to the cisco wet that's known from Lake Superior. So these bottom two, there's actually two deep water types, a red fin type and a kind of a grayer, blubbery looking thing. Uh, amazing fish. They're so fat that I can start telling stories. I shouldn't have much time. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had one that I put in our buoyancy tank of the lower one that when I had cut its air bladder, it literally, it just sort of sank in the water with its nose right at the surface. It was virtually neutral buoyancy and it was about a 12 pound fish. Uh, down in Lake Superior, uh, we recently just had a paper with Andrew Muir uh, confirming and identifying and showing the the redfin, which is the third one down, you have the, the fat, the humper, or a lean, and, and then the redfin there. That's, uh, historically, there's a number of papers based on anecdotal evidence that are probably 12 to 18 ecomorphal types in Lake Superior. Uh, so they characteristically are, are this occurring in large lakes, but even in a a smaller lake, like Lake Mistassini, which is the largest natural lake in Quebec, uh, we found a, a deep water form that's very similar to the Humper and Lake Superior, and even smaller in a lake about a square mile in size in Rush Lake in the upper peninsula of, of uh, Michigan, uh, we have a Humper form, but that, that's a very rare occurrence to see something like that in a small lake. So vulnerability, when are lake trout vulnerable to perturbations? Well, I mentioned the high total mortality. If you have that, you will have a collapse of that age structure. They are a large top predator. They're vulnerable to a variety of commercial gears and, and to sport fisheries. Uh, they provide valuable ecological services in terms of food, fish, and recreation. As such, they can suffer high fishing mortality. And if it goes above 40 to 45 percent, uh, that age structure will collapse, and that's going to affect their resiliency. So they're very vulnerable to that. Uh, when are they vulnerable? Uh, we know just based on experience in the Laurentian Great Lakes, they're vulnerable to invasive non-native non species. Uh, very uh, well known in, in these lakes, and particularly sea lamprey, uh, high natural mortality due to predation that occurs in the autumn. Just an example, if you haven't seen these things, here's a lamprey wound. And this lake trout has been attacked more than once, as you can see from possibly in the back, probably not, but some scarring that has occurred on this fish. Uh, also, non-native species, elwives. Uh, elwives uh, known to be a lake trout fry predator and also causing a diet-mediated 
thiaminase deficiency, essential B vitamin for reproductive physiology. And so in combination, Lake uh, Elwise, Hammer, Lake Trout, a couple different areas. So what about these ecosystems? Are Lake Trout ecosystems uh, resilient? Uh, I found that one difficult to answer. They're always the oligotrophic systems, and maybe smart people like some of you here can tell me, are oligotrophic systems ever resilient? Uh, in the Great Lakes, we had many species were lost. Uh, this is the Laurentian Great Lakes. We had a nine species complex of deep water corrigonates that were essentially collapsed into a hybrid form that people are calling Corrigonus hoyae, and that's in Lake Michigan and Huron. Lake sturgeon uh, was a dominant aspect of the communities, and they were virtually wiped out of the Great Lakes. I suspect a very large uh, biomass occurs, such as in Lake Ontario, Huron, and Michigan. Uh, in my musings about this, uh, I thought too, though, that the high volume of deep waters in the Great Lakes uh, buffer the effects of near shore degradation, and that enhances the resiliency. Uh, clearly vulnerable to aggressive planktivores and vulnerable to invasive species. I think especially inland waters, my own experience in Minnesota, uh, some thinking about New York, walleye, small bass, a couple examples that when they've gotten into systems, the lake trout seem to not do very well. Uh, small lakes too, vulnerable to nutrient enrichment. You can get the hypolimnion becoming deoxygenated, and then if you have uh, warming going on on small lakes, you'll get them pressed up into the metalimnion and ultimately a loss of lake trout habitat. This is a threat to not only lake trout but also uh, Cisco and Corrigonus artifact. So it's complex to answer about management. Uh, Don did, a, I think, a really great job. Hit on it. several points of management about elements that are important for resiliency. Uh, and there could be a whole afternoon just talking about this. Um, the thing that I thought about that I thought was most important is if you can manage stakeholder expectations, uh, if you can get them to understand the nature and causes of ecological variation, the risk that occurs in management decision making, the risk to the populations, and then the uncertainty in our understanding. Uh, and then I reflected upon the Lake Ontario Management Plan of 1981 that was uh, by New York State and Ontario Ministry and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they really embraced many of the resiliency uh, characteristics of lake trout well before the term became trendy. Uh, their objectives in that plan called for the need for multiple age classes, control of total mortality, that Achilles heel of lake trout, and the introduction of ecomorphotypes before there was even a word, ecomorphotypes. And that was including a punitive deep water form. The success in its implementation was limited in part because Lake Ontario was not in any sort of stable equilibrium and also there was unexpected new invasive species came in. Okay, so are, is this lake trout really any sort of uh, ecologically resilient? I would say, well, yes, uh, they are when the communities and ecosystems have not been compromised. They have diet diversity, multiple age classes, broad habitat use, and this is all kind of wrapped up into this ecomorphic type uh, concept. On the other hand, no, they're not ecologically resilient. They are vulnerable to high total annual mortality rates that can be caused by fisheries or invasive species. As far as uh, ecosystems, I, I think it's a gradation. I think the larger the lake, with the higher volume of water, the more buffered they are, and potentially more resilient. I think small lake trout ecosystems are especially vulnerable to eutrophication, invasive species, and warming. In terms of management, uh, I think resiliency comes through managing stakeholder expectations and then being able to be responsive to changing ecological and social circumstances. The capability to make decisions fairly rapidly without going through a 
long and drawn out administrative process. And it's a real important element. And I would argue that the 1981 Lake Ontario plan in New York was well ahead of its time. So thanks, and I'll take any questions at first time. Set up for a panel discussion.